Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to everyone who is attending this Future Ready webinar series that we started with Helper NGO. Um, the, as we know, for the previous 30 years, India has gone through a significant economic reform. We've seen it. Many of us who lived through the era pre-1991 and what we've seen over the last few decades has been absolutely amazing and it cannot recognize the India of pre-1991 and the India of today. But having said that, the next 20 years will be very defining for India and for many parts of the world. And the key really is what do we need to do to make India future ready? And what do you as an individual need to do to make yourself future ready for the next couple of decades? With me, my uh, guest today is Mr. Rani Skruwala. Uh, Rani needs little introduction, but I'll quickly, you know, if I look at Rani, uh, when I knew him from pre-1991, or certainly knew of him, uh, he's always been an entrepreneur, for those who may have read the book, uh, or, you know, keep your wide, eyes wide open to face the future effectively. And, uh, you know, Rani started a show business, which he may not remember himself, which is called Culture Club way ahead of its time. And then of course he had Unilaser for the toothbrush manufacturing. And then clearly by, from the 1991, after the reforms, he built UTV. And as far as I know, he's the only media mogul in the world who has sold companies successfully, built them successfully and sold them at great valuations and great, and after having built them to Bloomberg, to Disney and to Murdoch. Um, and then, of course, over the last uh, over the last decade or so, he set up along with his wife Serena Swades Foundation to help one million people, primarily uh, within the Raigad district of Maharashtra, to help improve their lives across different aspects of their lives. And uh, for those of you following Ronnie recently, you know that he's now the proud owner of a unicorn upgrade. Um, has has crossed that sort of magical valuation and uh, joined a, a couple of very unique and select companies in India to have reached a billion dollar market cap. And at the time of doing so, uh, revenues were about $130 million. And I'm sure they'll be sort of doubling every quarter for the next couple of years. Uh, Rani recently wrote the book, Skill It, and it, uh, Skill it, Kill It, on how to improve yourself and how to upgrade your, your sort of skill sets over time. Uh, with that, uh, Rani, can I just ask you if you don't mind to sort of describe yourself, what Rani was like, the pre-1991 Rani, uh, when you were the first time entrepreneur at that point in time, and what is what was the 1991 to 2020 era Rani? What were the characteristics that defined you then and defined you in the most recent time in history? Yeah, I think it's, a, thank you, thank you, Ajit, for, for, the, for having me here for this uh, very nice introduction. Um, to describe what you were 30 years back or 25 years, 30 years back is, is fun in some ways. Um, you know, I think when I look back, um, there was a fair amount of what I would, I, I came from a lower middle-class background. Uh, and therefore, when I wrote my book recently called Soft, uh, Skill It, Kill It, it's basically on soft skills. Because at Upgrad, I meet a learner, students, working professionals day in and day out. And I saw that level of, lack of confidence and soft skills when you come to whatever else. And if I had to go back 30 years, I would say I was at that stage. I personally see myself as a product of soft skills. I really wanted it badly to be a good communicator, to have self-confidence, self-conviction. Um, and I think I worked really, really hard. Today, it sounds like I'm talking extempore with you, but it wasn't that easy 30 years back, or 30, you know, and I think that's mostly what I recollect, which actually represents the era, because you asked me the question, what was overall 1991, you know, I mean, I think at that stage, people, I'd like to say, thought incrementally, not exponentially, if I had to sort of put that as one tag. Um, I think it was very difficult to do business at that time. It's much less difficult. I don't think it's completely rosy, but it's much less difficult today to do business than it was then. Entrepreneurship, I would say, had a social stigma, if I can use that word, you know. Um, it was like, and literally at that stage, a lot of people would look you up and say, hmm, 
So you couldn't find yourself a job anywhere. Now you have to go start working for yourself. And then there was the entire social pressure of overcoming, uh, convincing the family who were equally and rightfully uh, nervous about where that would land for you. Um, it was also the era I felt where it was very intimidating to go out there and start something on your own, right? Because there were really large groups, the conglomerates, the groups who really wanted to own anything and everything. And it was a combination of whatever it was, the license Raj going to whatever else, to everything else. So intimidating because you never, you fault the gap with whatever you do in life to where other people have reached will always be enormous. Not so right now, but at that time it was there. And I think people were looking for business ideas that were more, I would say, sustenance oriented, import replacement oriented, and a very different DNA and a different mindset. So in that landscape, I think, um, I think, you know, I kept my feet on the ground and it builds that kind of resilience in you that really makes you feel after all the failures kind of, for me, what have you got to lose and how badly do you want it? And I think those operating ones work well for me. And, you know, sort of going back to the soft skills part, you're really underselling yourself. I remember seeing you in a play called Children of a Lesser God. I don't know if you remember that yourself. If you I remember that video. very, very clearly, because I had yeah. to learn for four months sign language to oh. talk to the hearing impaired and right. um, you know and uh, speaking impaired. That's right. I mean, if you if you want to do a course on soft skills, that's it. Just watch that play, and you'll see Ronnie at his brilliant best, communicating feelings, emotions. A very, very powerful play. I don't know if you have it somewhere on video, but you should put it up on YouTube. I think. Uh, and, and provided you, and, you buy the book, you, you should do that. Theater, you buy the book to get to see the video for free. <laughs> theater for me played a, uh, played a very big evolutionary role in my ability to be collaborative, in my ability to communicate, in my self-confidence. Uh, it just, it was an incredibly, uh, uh, you know, I did it as a hobby, but I don't think I'd be half where I am today if it wasn't for, for the hobby that I had at that right. time. So, you know, you spoke about import substitution and the desire not to take risks and not to be an entrepreneur in that pre-1991 era. And, you know, your own story, when you say you went with your father to London and you happened to see that machine, uh, you know, which was that wonderful toothbrush manufacturing machine, and you decided to buy it without even having the money to buy it and kind of taking that on. So, you know, that was import substitution. Now, if I look at Ronnie today, there's people chasing you. There's people, you know, there's sort of capital available that time capital was extremely scarce and you really had to find that ready market as opposed to create a you know, market opportunity in some sense. Has, has that changed in sort of in between 91 and the year 2020 was an evolution in that, in terms of- There's you know, no question about the- getting yourself, but, yeah. but there's no question about the fact that when I started, debt was out of the question, unless you were mm -hmm. starting a manufacturing operation and people had hard assets as Leon. Uh, and you had some seed money. Um, but I would say today, it does seem that way that there is a lot more surplus capital. But for a lot of people, I would say cautionary, it's, it's a really, it's, it's, it's a lot of money chasing few that really need to outperform or mm -hmm. people who are great storytellers or segments that are really in high growth mode today may not be tomorrow. So yes, Definitely capital is much more available today. I don't think the debt situation has changed at all. I don't think you know uh, banks banks will give to conglomerates and then write off bad debts by the billions of the dollars, but they won't give it to startup entrepreneurs for some inane mm -hmm. reason. I think they'd have had a better chance if uh, on their bad debts, if they had actually taken the younger generation who had a different level of governance, a different level of approach to business, et cetera. But on the good side, I think equity is there. I wouldn't use the word chase. You know, you have three or four very maverick investors, so they emulate the word chase. But at the end of the day, I think there is supportive capital for good execution, good ideas, good storytellers, strong vision. That's what I would say. So if I go back to the Ronnie of pre-1991, who had that phenomenal skill set of soft skills, then between 1991 and 2020, Ronnie becomes an investment banker par excellence. He does all these phenomenal deals, builds fantastic companies, becomes a successful business person. 
the Rani for the next 20 years, what skill sets are you planning to acquire for yourself to be relevant and to have leadership as you've shown over the last few decades for the next 20 years? How are you going to be future ready? You know, I think I'm going to more than finding new traits. I want to polish some of my old ones, correct the cost on some of them. Uh, one of them, I think, is focus. We underrate, underrate focus big time. And especially mm -hmm. today when you've got so many distractions and the, and, the here, and the herd mentality of opportunities are so strong and the FOMO is so strong on almost everything that you do. So herd mentality, FOMO, opportunities, if you look at that, it's almost like you shouldn't be sleeping. You know, and, and it's almost like I'm going to miss out on this and I'm going to miss out on that opportunity. So to me, actually, less for more, um, focus, staying the course and continuing to feel, um, you know, how badly do I want it? Because actually that really gets you past most failures, you know, and I asked a lot of my team members at the end of the day, somebody said something and he says, yeah, simple things like he just said, you know, he's doing something for an international thing and he didn't have a passport or his passport had expired. And I said, you know, that's an excuse as far as I'm, I mean, we obviously didn't want to travel that badly or whatever. Right. So just anything as small or anything that's yeah. big. Um, I think these are, these, are my, these are what I would polish, 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 polish and, and mm -hmm. get forward. Well, I'm sure Ronnie must have already started doing that before you wrote the books, right? In some <laughs> sense. But, uh, you know, again, uh, if you are an entrepreneur today, an entrepreneur today, what does it take to be a successful entrepreneur for the future? What would you advise compared to being an entrepreneur in the historic past? If you don't have nerves of steel and if you can't mm -hmm. handle failure, I'm going to, mm -hmm. you know, everyone thinks successful entrepreneur means uh, ability to raise capital. I think that's the last right. of the priority. I'm, I'm, I'm just surprised how everyone just feels and they can give themselves, of course, it's great that somebody's willing to back you and you raise some mm -hmm. capital. But capital is really down the ladder as far as that is concerned. I think just the absolute ability to take um, risks uh, and which I don't think we do that much, number one. Number two, just handling failure, whichever way you look at that. And trust me, the failures that you would find in the beginning will be nothing compared to the ones as you grow and the stakes are even high. Um, so I think it's not just about resilience. It's also, you have to be contrarian today, whether you like it or not, which means that 99 out of 100 people will tell you, this is not a good thing to do. No, I don't think this is going to work out. And when things don't work out, they'll come back and tell you, I told you so. But that's also fine because they can tell you that I told you so for about six times. They can't tell you for all 10 times. Um, so I think that's pretty important. And something I feel very strongly about, and I do say this quite often is, look, I mean, for me, my success ratio is two out of 10. Now people say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. it should be six out of 10. Otherwise, how do you stay afloat? And I, I think I, 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 this is a mathematical thing for me. And I've calculated that because there are eight times that I would have failed for the two times that I've succeeded. But when I fail, it's a one X, like whatever it was, it's risk, whatever that may be, a bad hiring judgment, a bad business, a sector, taking an early call, late call, losing money, shutting a business, whatever that may be, it's a one X. That doesn't mean it's a small one X, it's a one X. Right. But the two times that you do succeed have to be 20 X. But you can't do a 20x success unless you've actually had those eight failures because you're not enough taking the risk of pushing the envelope and thinking non-linear. And I think that part of thinking is going to make that differentiation of a long-term entrepreneur versus making a deal with yourself that says, you know, I'll try this for a couple of years and see if I succeed. Yeah. And that to me is really it. If you're not ashamed of the, of the fact that, you know, I, you know, the ratio is eight is to two, but the risk has to be taken because the 2x has to be 20x, the two times right. you succeed. The two success. So then the maths is that's a 40 and it's mm -hmm. a minus eight. So you're plus 32. Right. I mean, right. literally. Yeah, correct. And, and so for that 1x failure, do you give it six months, one year, two years? How, how long before you say, okay, it's a failure and I better do something else as an entrepreneur? You know, I think, I think um, you have to give things that, that, that you share of time. And I don't think uh, you can time that failure or success. Actually staying the course has worked much better for me than actually pulling the plug. 
So, but, and it's not sometimes pulling the plug. The pulling the plug could be on an idea or a business. It won't be on your own. And more, most of the time when you pull the plug, you pull the plug on yourself and not on the idea, not on the business, not on the enterprise, not on the hire. And I think that's the difference. You can't pull the plug on yourself ever. That's one of the basic definitions of entrepreneurship. You can pull the plug on anything else you want to do. So I think that's what I would say is the differentiator. So there's no time frame per se. So uh, switching to another top and another aspect of being an entrepreneur today, you know, as you mentioned correctly, pre-1991, it was not good to be an entrepreneur. No one gave you capital. People thought you were crazy. Go big to join IIT, get a job, work for a multinational, work for a bank. Then post-91, particularly post the 90s and early 2000s, it is great to be an entrepreneur. But there has been in Silicon Valley in particular, and probably spilling over to India soon, that entrepreneurs are not sensitive to things like gender equality, to pay gap. There's a whole ESG framework, which the world is looking at a lot more closely for every company, including startups. So at what point in time does an entrepreneur have to start worrying about the equation of ESG versus focusing on the great business idea for, the, you know, for that 20x rate of return? Do they start from day one or does it happen it has somewhere to be from along the day journey? I wouldn't even say day one. And look, I'm not saying it in a facetious manner or in a, oh yeah, mm -hmm. everyone would say that same answer. And let me just try and explain that or expand that, but it has to be day zero because normally when you start an organization, while you're thinking of your idea and you're thinking of your team, one of the first things you're thinking of is the culture because that's going to propel you. That's going to outlast so many other things that you do in an organization. And therefore, defining this is part of defining that basic culture of people. Because if it's, if it's about a little bit of caring and a little bit of sensitivity, and most important with empathy, this will come with empathy. Empathy will actually get you your best team members. It'll see you through a lot of failures. It'll build loyalty in a team in a very, very, very different manner. So I don't think we should just look at it in that sense. Now, a lot of people will say, okay, fine, I understand gender equality, but, you know, climate change, I'm in technology. I mean, I'm not, I'm not manufacturing anything. I'm not exuding anything. I'm not doing anything. What do I need to do on that? But I think it's about as basic as culture and therefore has to be on day zero. And, and you know, within that also is the thing about the boards, right? What is the role of a board in a startup? What sort of governance structures do you have? What sort of controls do you have on the entrepreneur? Or do you believe that the venture capital world will just allow the entrepreneur to run with the capital as far as they need to without worrying about you know, reporting functions, functionality of the sort of regular state? Like if you're a listed company, there are all these sort of governance rules that you have to follow. If you're a startup, you don't have those rules. But do you think there'll be any change or you think the venture capital will be exempt from the venture capital investing company will be exempt from all these reporting requirements, you know, having more people on the board, having outsiders on the board, having independent board members, et cetera. You know, there has to be some amount of chaos before there is order, you know, mm -hmm. otherwise you'll have a country like Singapore, very admirable, fantastic, but you know, it's chock a block. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, they're managing a COVID crisis, which to me in South Bombay, uh, we could have managed it in a very different way, you know, almost a year back. And no, no criticism meant here at all, but I'm just giving you that as an example. So I think, um, yeah, I would, I mean, so what did your question being that? Uh, so see, do you I think need governance is a big word. Of yeah, I think yeah. governance yeah. is a big word. Right. In a long time back in manufacturing, when you were taking debt, you were dealing with institutions, mm -hmm. there was a different level, of, you know, so, it's intimidating on day one to have an audit committee, a compensation committee, a, an ESOP committee, a hiring committee, a firing committee. You know, that's not giving you the box to be able to operate in a particular manner. Because assuming you want to hire somebody, a lot of that finally is going to be based on chemistry and gut. Now, three more board members hiring that person is not going to make a sense. I also believe that if the DNA of the founder culture in the organization is one of openness, transparency, and the basic things. That in itself today is governance. You know, in the listed companies, yes, there are some statutory things because there are some obligations and fiduciary responsibilities. Fiduciary responsibilities don't have to start on day one when, you, when A, you own 100% of the company, or later on you own 80% of the company, or 60%, as long as your communication and your transparency with your venture capital and later private equity investors are very thorough. 
but it shouldn't box you into a sandbox that does not allow you to operate the level at which you would operate at. And okay, uh, moving back to capital, which we touched upon earlier. So in the last few months, we've seen a sort of implosion in China with what's happened with ed tech and state control. And, you know, in general, China saying, you know, we're party first, we're socialist first, and sort of profitability comes a little later down the line. There's a change happening there. Do you think that will put more capital towards India, more abundant supply of capital and talent that starts kind of looking to India to partner, to build things out here? Is that a plus for India? In, See, way? in my 30 years of work experience, somebody's problem has not really helped somebody else gain on that over a period of time. I mean, yeah, it's a little bit of a wave and it'll go up and down, but in the overall scheme of things, the people who want to invest into China want to invest in China for very different reasons. You know, the absolute leftover people who just have surplus capital that are getting 0.25% ROI and want to invest in another growth country would look at this. So I think when people come in with a strategy, it's not about reallocating funds that can't be there. I think it's not even a regulatory risk in China. It's much more a political uh, mandate right now. All the regulation changes. It's much more about, and look, from their perspective, they feel, and a lot of that is actually uh, focused on the younger generation, right? Because China mm -hmm. is a single child country and they want right. to change that thing. Mm -hmm. So if you see it, all the regulations outside of, you know, maybe Jack Ma making a statement and therefore they're feeling they need to bring that to heel um, is around gaming, education, everything for that minus zero to 16 years. But actually at the parents who are actually feeling I don't want to bring another kid into the world because it's too tough to do that or too expensive to do that. So that's a very different yeah. psychology uh, of why China would do what it wants to do. Mm -hmm. That's just my personal opinion. I, I'm not saying that um, that could be the facts. But I, personally, I felt that um, people come in to invest in different entities and organizations. It's not like if e-commerce collapses today, people mm -hmm. will go into food tech or whatever else. People who wanted to take a bet, they will take a bet. Also, psychologically, when you feel, ah, if something so sudden can happen in such a high growth market, you sometimes want to be a little bit more reflective because you feel, ah, okay, India, yes, but maybe, you know, could be another country with political uh, risk, regulatory risk, X risk, Y risk. You know, they've, they've had retrospective regulations in the past. Of course, that's been evened out right now. Uh, foreign investment is always a big question mark. So. Personally, I'm not, I'm not sure. Ripple effect, okay. yes. Tsunami, no. Okay, good. So it used to be, right, as a traditional value investor, that's, that's our background as quantum. Subhu and I, Subhu will be asking questions later on. Subhu and I built this value investment process for India to buying listed stocks. And one of the things we did was, you know, try to identify companies as Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger say, which have moats around them, a defense. So if you have a big steel factory, a big cement factory, an automobile plant, it takes years for someone else to get the approval, get the license, get the product, get the distribution. That itself acts like a moat. But in a tech-driven world, it's capital and ideas. And ideas and smart people are abundant. And capital is flowing abundant. So what would be the moat for an upgrade? To take an example. I mean, any of the tech companies, what stops a tech company from being wiped out by the next bigger you know, version of what's just been built? What modes do you build around, say, upgrade? So, I mean, firstly, I think um, overall, when you look at modes, um, if capital was ever a mode, it's never a mode. It is never a mode. And I think for people, and actually, there are a few investors that have almost psychologically um, you know, brainwashed a few people that says, you need 200 million, no, take half a billion. Because then just go out and conquer the world and do whatever you have to do. And I would say 99 out of 100 times that has not worked and it will not work. Because if capital was the solution, uh, the lot would come in there. Actually, what you do with capital is that you burn a lot of it on into inverted commas brand building and brands are never built by advertising and marketing and awareness campaigns. They're built over a certain period of time. They just take their time. Yes, you can get market share, but in pursuit of market share, you'll have to figure out whether you're actually building a fundamentally strong business. Will you have fundamental gross margins that will ever turn positive, et cetera? Jury's out on many of that. So I don't think it's capital. For upgrade, for example, our moat is actually quite clear. Deep learning 
experience because right now our biggest challenge is while you know uh, the covid has put online and center stage mm-hmm. the bad news for us is it's almost made it sound like it's a simplistic zoom operation where we spent years on our technology platform and years on our learning experience so we our differentiator is outcomes outcomes in terms of completion people who take an 11 month course pay a lot of money and then complete it and the outcomes which is jobs increments or furtherment in your career if we get that wrong continuously it does make a difference where I, whether i can raise half a billion dollars a billion dollars or whatever else so you know stay so kind of staying a bit with upgrade 130 million a billion dollar of market cap plus and you know obviously there's a lot of growth behind this when someone is designing a new company a startup do they begin or should they begin by saying i'm going to be a unicorn and work towards it or that unicorn sort of happens over time the unicorn pathway happens I, over time I, how, how would you recommend we have i i i am not the right guy to talk about unicorns i i don't i don't i don't relate to that genuinely i think it's a means to an end yeah i mean did we go out and target it not at all for first 5 years we funded the business completely on our own if we really wanted to get to be a unicorn we'd have done a little bit of a venture capital then a little bit of private equity and whatever else so this is a means to an end and i think you know it's almost like saying should an entrepreneur start a business knowing that in 3 years or 4 years he's going to exit it and create value and take some money home you can't time it you can't time it at all so i think you're you're imagine what your vision will get shifted if you start looking at things like i want to be a unicorn because then you'll start viewing your entire business vision through the eyes of people who can view you enough to invest in you to make you a unicorn and imagine what that can do to a company's vision so you know that's the thing right do uh, so i remember a friend of mine told me uh, she graduated at stanford a couple of years ago and i congratulated her a friend's daughter I congratulated her for graduating at stanford and she said ajit uncle actually i'm a failure because uh, it used to be that the incoming class at stanford would look up to those who were graduating saying wow you struggled through four years in the undergrad two years in the mba and you made it through congratulations and we're going to you know it's going to be tough for us but that's but you're a kind of guiding light and now it's like the incoming class looks at the graduating class and saying you guys are duffers you had to actually finish stanford and you know you are you're, you're a failure because if you had succeeded you'd have left stanford or harvard or whatever and you'd be a unicorn by now so it's a very different mindset that seems to be there may not be true in india but certainly in many of the leading universities there that you go to the university not to necessarily finish your your this studies but to get some idea and meet other people and then go out and get the funding and become a unicorn that seems to be driving people out in the west is that i would say yes do you, do you sort of see that among the you know? yeah i think i would say yes a little bit but i think 70 out of 100 people still want to get into investment banking or get into all the sexy jobs in new york or in silicon valley still right at the end of the day so i think it's a mix of the failures Yes, those are I the agree. failures. No, I, I, I wouldn't. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the fifth on that. I'm not going to comment on that. But, <laughs> but, uh, but, I think um, hunger, passion. If, if I would say today, what I'm noticing since 2015 to now is aspiration levels and ambition levels in India have soared. Have they've changed and they've soared? So I, I think of that as the cup half full. the cup half empty is then you go pursuit of unicorn get funding i won't raise my this right. thing to do that but i think the two things really that has happened working professionals or professionals in their career today are feeling at 35 and 40 i'm kind of stuck which was you normally would happen at 50 and 55 right and therefore should i start something on my own if i don't start it now then when will i start it so that ambition and aspiration a little bit of raw energy um i think is very infectious and it has started so you know i I'd, i'd like to end just by asking a bit about you know giving and uh, you know you've done you and zarina done a fabulous thing with swadesh where we live in a country we're not in singapore we live in a relatively poor country with a significant amount of people who don't have the opportunities that all of us on this zoom call have had uh, and and we need to look after them we need to find them ways to climb up the economic ladder etc over time 
So can you just explain a bit about Swadesh, what made you start it? Uh, why Raigad? What's the focus and how do you think it's evolved? Uh, yeah, I would, I would say to everyone here, firstly, but that one started this more than 30 years back. So this myth about everyone saying, A, you need to have a bank balance and B, you need some gray hair before you start giving back, I think is flawed. And that's because the word philanthropy is such a long word and so heavy that it almost sounds like, oh, I got to be, uh, you know, so it, there's not, it's not a cool and hip mm-hmm. word. I mean, I think, so to me, we started that 30 years ago. Uh, why? I don't know. Maybe the Parsi genes, I can't sit down and figure out what was it. But we just said 10% of whatever we would make, we'd give back. At that time, we were not making anything. So it wasn't a question of giving back. However, the very first office we rented was 10,000 square feet. And we demarked 1,000 square feet of that for an orphanage in an old, uh, on a crash in an old age home. And the first 30 people that came in there, they actually spent more time after hours during lunch breaks with all of those people there. And that became the culture and the bonding of the organization. And I think for the first seven, eight, 10 years and and including many directors who came in and investors and they said, you know, you've got this new articles or whatever else that says you'll give 10% back, but what about the years you're not gonna make money? And I said, exactly that. This is a resource that we would do. The first person I employed in the foundation uh, came from Raigad district in Maharashtra. And one fine day she said, look, this is all lovely, but drive with me to this area because it's tremendous monsoon. And then for five months, there's zero water. And without water, you can't change anybody's lives. Forget about livelihood, forget about education, forget about health. So we drove down there and that's when our rural uh, introduction happened. And we started in a very small manner with about I think 39 or 40 villages, which does appear large. I mean, 39, 40 villages, not that small, but that's again, with very, very, very limited resources. And it was only in 2012 after we divested UTV to Disney. And for the first time, I was not somebody who had taken debt to send my daughter to college, but actually had a bank balance that was not with a debt uh, in the first time in my life. That's when we said, what do we want to do with Swadesh? So that's one thing led to another. So Raigad was really, we were there. We had built trust. We felt rural India wanted it more. There were too many NGOs operating in the big cities anyway, doing an incredible amount of work. So we spent the better part of year just meeting about 400 NGOs to redefine our vision for Swadesh. And that's what happened. And that time it was called SHARE. And then one fine day, there were six students from Colombia who had come down and were going to visit our village for a three-day project report. And they were sitting on our veranda and we were talking and, and we had made a movie long time back called Swadesh, where Shah Rukh Khan comes back from NASA and goes to the village and creates the hydraulic system that lights up the bulb of the village kind of situation. And I just told Zaina, you know, this sounds like a very Swadesh moment sitting on our veranda. So immediately, you know, I called Sharuk and Ashutosh Gavarekar, the director, and said, we're going to call our foundation Swadesh if we don't mind. And that's pretty much how it's happened so far. And what has it been like? I mean, you know, you said you'll try to bring a million people, uplift a million people in Raigad. How's it worked? How's that panned out the last 10 years? Hard work. Very different work. Totally different DNA. To walk in out of a for-profit review meeting and to walk into a not-for-profit review meeting and I think the first two, three years, the biggest mistake I made was making targets. And I can only tell you that you can't make tackle targets in a not-for-profit space, for example, because that you're making targets for your community. And you're assuming the community will want this from you and will actually do this here and will accept you with open hands and whatever else. Um, and I think we've learned an incredible amount from education to health. The holy grail for us is now livelihood. So we start with solving the water and sanitation problem, which just makes everyone livable, stop migration into the cities to that extent. I know people want to, and it's aspirational, but it's not actually, because you met enough people in the big cities and they want to actually go back, but they just feel it's not that viable. Then you work on health and education, but really it's about the, when when is each of us in control of our death? We are only good when we are in control of our own destiny. And that's when you have financial inclusion and you have some money. So unless you do that, you can't really exit from any geography because that real empowerment is going to come when not only do they have 4x, 5x of what they're earning every year, number one, but they understand financial inclusion. Half our problem today is when I'm asking someone who has one acre of land that why don't I'm going to I'm going to do the drip water irrigation. I'm going to invest in that. And now you can do three crops a year. He says, yeah, but can I just try for one-fourth of the acre? Because for him, 
he doesn't understand that what will it make. Here, all of us will go out in the real world and say, okay, this is a great plan. What will it take for you to do the 3x of the revenue? Different mindset. Very different mindset, yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Rani. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Subhu, uh, to ask uh, queries that have come in from the visitors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Subhu. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, hi, Rani. Hi, uh, thanks, Ajit, for this um, uh, wonderful interview with a um, lot of background. So I'll just go back to my first meeting with you, Rani. I, I came along with Ajit uh, to your Andheri office. And um, the business at that time, which we were looking at, uh, which, you were, uh, which you had founded, uh, was TV shopping. Yeah. Uh, so when Ajit introduced you, he did not refer to that business, but I remember that meeting and it looked very exciting business, uh, but somehow that didn't um, it take failed. off the way you had imagined uh, or we had also imagined. Uh, so I want to uh, know something about uh, your learnings from that. Where was it uh, that it didn't work out? Was it concept? Was it too early? Was it infrastructure? Uh, so some areas where you can tell us as to how do you look at uh, you know, not failures, but deciding not to pursue that dream. Yeah, no, it was an out and out failure. And maybe if I can summarize those learnings there, I think one was uh, sometimes it's a small and a very thin line between pioneering and being a little bit before your time. And I think in India, between the context of low credit card penetration, uh, touch and feel being a very high element of, of things at that stage, other than one or two products where you don't have to touch and feel. Uh, and no brand recall. I mean, I think today the e-commerce giants really started because they take, took big brands and sold them online. So you didn't have to go past the credibility. At that stage, you didn't have a Samsung or a, or a, or a, a LG refrigerator, whatever you were selling. So I think that would be the second one uh, that it was before its time from a credibility point of view. The second one is, you know, we had a hit product on day one called the Roti Maker. And relying too much on that actually was definitely in hindsight a strong error. Um, the third, and I would say the one that actually tilted us the most is this was the reason, this was the time when everyone was going through the dot-com craze. And almost everyone, including uh, people from your side and all our investors, and I remember meeting Bill Draper at that time. And he just said, let's morph this business into, you know, where's the website? Where's the this, where's the that? And India was really not ready to even start looking at home shopping with delivery, forget about, you know, where's the website. So I think um, our, that was to me the turning point where we over-invested in the internet of things when people were not ready. And that kind of led totally to the, to the overall like time where one felt uh, this is not gonna work. Maybe we need to pull the plug. Uh, <clears throat> so, so there are some questions which have come up. So I'll just read out one or two of them. Um, so if you were in your early 30s today and working as a working professional in a, in a very top position in a technology company, uh, if you were to decide now whether to continue in the job, even though you are in, at a very good position, or to be an entrepreneur, uh, what is it that will excite you and what would you do in your life? Well, whoever's asking that question, I would say, number one, I would urge you not to seek advice on a specific question like this, because how is anyone else going to put yours? I have to put myself in my own shoes. I, it, is a, it is a call that I need to take. I need to understand why I want to do it. Again, how badly do I want to do it? Uh, and those reasons and the consequences of actually doing it and not trying it out. One of the biggest problems is when people say, Okay, at 30, whatever I got to lose, I'll give myself 33 if it works, fine. Otherwise, I've got a degree, I've got this, I'll come back. Guaranteed failure, you will be coming back to a job. So I would say to you, you know, talk to somebody who can ask you 10 questions about why you want to do it, whatever else, and get somebody to ask you the 10, 20, 30 hard questions that you're not asking yourself. Don't ask anyone for advice. It is, it is such a personal decision. Because it's not about this decision that you make, actually, which sounds like a hard one today, it will be the easiest decision you'll be making when you move to be an entrepreneur. So if you're taking too much time in thinking about this, you need to figure out, can I overthink and be an entrepreneur? And the question is no. Do I need empirical evidence before I make my decision? There is no such thing as empirical evidence. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
uh, on the exits uh, which you made on the businesses which you um, helped them grow and then decided to sell them so what were the key parameters or uh, what were your thoughts uh, like did you not want to continue in those business or was it the challenges which were um, very difficult or uh, what exactly were the key points you looked at when you built these businesses and decided to sell them to other large companies yeah i think firstly never ever plan to exit any business it you know i think sequences happen the first business one started which was cable tv um, and i think after five or six years the regulatory environment got tough and a lot of people who were i, I just felt we we could not construct uh, conduct a business in a very respectful and right governance manner so the best was to step out of it and at that stage my coo of the organization was going to leave and join another one who wanted to start a cable company so i just popped the question to him and says you know why don't you just take the company and start with a head start because in my mind it was regulatory wise i'm not comfortable doing that later on when i started a toothbrush operation ran for a longest period of time and i would not have exited it was always cash flow and positive had very strong nostalgic views but um at that time modoc and news corp had bought a, 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 a stake in lu tv at that stage which was my primary aspect and we were going public and i wanted to raise my own equity stake in the company and so it was should i own this business and that or should i consolidate and put all my eggs in one basket and that's what i chose to do which is why i went out for liquidity later on you know when i exited overall media and entertainment and lu tv it was just one of those things never planned you know disney was sitting on my board uh, for the longest period of time and they would always discuss their strategy in india and we discuss our strategy and one fine day they just popped the question and says why don't we put it all together and at that stage my first initial reaction is no wait a minute but then you know it just felt it made eminent sense in so many ways that in about a month it for most people it would be a hard decision i have to say for me it wasn't and i think that to me is when you get emotional about something versus being passionate about it it's a huge difference between you know you can be passionate about what you're doing but the minute you get emotional about a business that you're running and not then your objectivity goes away so i think that's just been my the exits whenever they happen uh rani can you just clarify when you say emotional and passion and just distinguish between the two is subtle but important difference Thank yeah you. yeah i mean i think if i was emotional about utv i wouldn't have taken that final call that says okay i'm willing to exit um was i always passionate about the company that i built absolutely along with a lot of great team members and co-founders number one uh was i passionate about media and entertainment yes i think i i worked very hard to change quite a few of the landscapes uh, along with many many others um but when it came to the final decision i think that emotions normally play a role where you feel no 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 how can it's like i'm letting that i'm letting something go versus maybe the 1300 people who worked for us at that time they actually felt after a period of time a great sense of pride that they could actually get to the next level and i could pursue other things over a certain period of time so i think um if i was emotional and says how can i how how can i because that's the normal reaction i think it would have been a problem thank you um Uh, coming to issues like big data uh, artificial intelligence these were not uh, uh, so prevalent when you when you started your entrepreneurial career now it has become a significant chunk of doing any business how do you look at these trends and as an entrepreneur uh, what if you were to start being an entrepreneur today how do you how will you look at these areas Uh, in terms of uh, understanding mastering what exactly would you do if you can just clarify with their role i am an entrepreneur today i have restarted 6 years back with our grad for us everything there is technology it's all online it's all technology it's high touch technology everything is about data everything is about artificial intelligence it's all about predicting the careers of tomorrow not just in india but around the world so it's not like hey i'm out of place i just started that business 5 6 years ago uh so i think it's a little bit like you know um it is future proofing yourself to a certain level uh you don't need to have the domain knowledge for everything but it is important that you harness it and not get intimidated by it i think most people get just feel it's too complex and it's intimidating i don't feel it's too do i understand it fully absolutely not i'm not from that generation that's wired that way 
but I know that I'm not wired that way, which means I either need to surround myself. So in some parts of this role of what is today happening, I'm a catalyst. So it takes an art to be a catalyst where you surround yourself with people, but yet you can ask those 20 really strong questions in the room that will even get them thinking, get them to respect you, even though you may not have the same knowledge they may have on data or X, Y, Z. And that's when you build the relationship and the team. Okay, thank you. So there were three, two or three questions which were very similar. And uh, so therefore I'll, I'll ask you that first. In terms of what do you think uh, are the key skills required today to be an entrepreneur? Like when you began, you identified for yourself a soft skill as one of the key areas. Uh, but today, given the environment, what exactly would you advise? Because there are three or four questions uh, similar. Yeah. Similar. I mean, that's can I just jump in, Ronnie? Can I jump in? I mean, in terms of upgrade, is upgrade going to upskill you to be an entrepreneur or upskill you to be, to be a manager? Or is it mix of both? If you could link it with what you're doing in Upgrad. I think, it. and just to answer that question, Upgrad's job is to, is to impact careers whichever way people want to go. It's not a, a manifesto that says, hey, come in as a working professional, come out of here on the conveyor belt as an entrepreneur. It is about actually getting you to the next level in the career, whichever way you want to do that, uh, and making you more and more relevant. Uh, it's not pointing you in any direction. So I think today, if you ask me again, so with this question of, you know, what are the traits? Actually, I don't think that's changed between 30 years back and now um, in many ways. I'm a firm believer in non-linear thinking. So outside of soft skills, if you're not non-linear, and I know normally the thing is about risk-taking and failures, which is one, it's told to death, so everyone needs to have that. But I think today, more than ever, you need to be a non-linear thinker. Uh, and what do I mean by that? you have to take enough risks. Second, you need to actually feel that the past is not as relevant as people because otherwise we're stuck in precedence. No, no, I tried this three years back, it didn't work. Who cares? Three years back is a lifetime. If it didn't work three years back, different, different environment, different consumer, different, you know. So I think the element of how, how much you want to push the envelope, which gets you back to your own self-conviction about what you want to do versus... Nine out of 10 times, again, people getting influenced by saying, you know, what is your view? What is your view? Take views. Of course, take views. But it's only to better your own sense of judgment, not to influence your judgment. And if you can do a fair amount of that, I think that's the road to being an entrepreneur. And lastly, I would just say it's a, you have to stay the course. There's no, comp there's no compromise. You can't time success. You can't time failure. Uh, you may be just round the bed into a success before you think I'm going to call it a day. You just have to stay the course because that means you're almost guaranteeing eventual success. The idea may not work. The hire may not work. The business may not work. You may run out of money. Yep. But stay the course as an entrepreneur. Are there any specific um, uh, tools you would say when it comes to staying the course? Because... Uh, I, I have heard this from many business people, including from you. Even in our own business, um, uh, we, we, at Quantum, we are trying to emulate a company called Vanguard. And one of the, the, the founders of that company, John Bogle, the key word he uses is staying the course. So if you can just elaborate a little as to, um, when you say staying the course, what kind of challenges could come and then give a, maybe give an example as to how you stayed the course? Well, I would say part of it is you got to pace the course, you know, and you can't go hurtling forward and you have to pace the course because I think a lot of people look at this binary because you feel you run a business. You've started the business by raising money. So your entire entitlement of starting a business was if it gets funded, I'm here. If it doesn't get funded, I'm not here. And that's a problem because then it's a binary effect in any case, and you're not actually staying the course. So pacing the cost where you want to be in business, you may have investors will come in and they will move out, but you have to stay in business all the time. And therefore pacing the course is as important as staying the course. Uh, the second one is you need to be three steps ahead of most people. Um, and that is very, very critical and important because that's gonna give you that edge. And again, it comes back to that nonlinear thinking and self-conviction. 
Uh, okay, uh, so just just give me a minute. I'll just go through some of the other questions. Yeah, which sure, are. absolutely. Ronnie, I have a question while someone's yeah. uh, sliding through about staying. You know, staying the course requires money, right? One of the things that an entrepreneur can sometimes be short of is their own capital to bootstrap, start on their own. And if they were to get external funding, then even the external funders may get impatient unless some milestones are met. So, you know, we may stay the course. Uh, there, there's one company that we built for 20 years. We're still staying the course on it. Now we're able to fund it. So that's good. Maybe that you, if you look at Helper NGO, Helper NGO itself has been around for like 20 years now. So, you know, we're staying the course on that and trying to build a database and allowing people, you know, helping not profits raise money, helping NGOs raise money. But not every entrepreneur will have that, you know, sort of cash in the bank to continue staying the course. Or if they've got external funding, the external yeah. funder is marketing to market and saying, well, you know, I've got limited capital, XYZ is doing better than you. So I'll give them round two and round three and series B and series C, et cetera, et cetera. So staying the course effectively has its own, you know, sort of debt cycle in some sense. Yeah, yeah. I think my first call is stay the course as an entrepreneur. You know, a business could have an up and down. You could actually shut down a business but that doesn't mean you're done as an entrepreneur. So my first okay. call, clarion call was, stay the course as an entrepreneur. Yes, try and stay the course in your business, but first and foremost, stay the course as an entrepreneur. If business shut down, what are you gonna do? That's not it. You have to be able to rise and go forward. So that was my first clarion call there of staying the course. Second, see, I'm not a big proponent that money solves so many problems. And I have to say that, I'm saying it with experience. It's not like saying, hey, that, that, that's okay for you to say it. Absolutely not. I didn't start with any capital. I didn't raise any debt. As you stated, they did right in your introduction. I looked at buying two toothbrush machines out of a factory in UK, and I didn't have a money, and I didn't have the order. That doesn't mean you need to be maverick about it, and it doesn't mean the cliche thing of you know, good ideas, money will follow good ideas. No, it doesn't always. But in the beginning... I was very clear that if I wanted to start and I didn't have the money and I didn't have the resources, for the first four or five years, we built what I would call a B2B business. And what do I mean by that? It was a cost plus business. You would find customers, you would find clients, and you would do that. So there's a lot you would do even when you want to stay the course. And stay the course, if you're planning a company that's going to constantly run out of money, then that's a different model altogether. It's predicated on your ability to raise funds rather than build a business. And I would caution that. So in summary, I would say staying the course is more the entrepreneur than the business. Second, don't make money the index. Third, even in the roughest of times, you can actually change your business into a little bit more of a low growth, possible profitability, slightly pivoted, move it to B2B, look at a cost plus um, and make it happen. You're on mute. Ajit, you're on mute. Ajit, you're on mute. Ajit, you're on mute. Sorry, my eyesight's not good. I'm pressing the button, but not hard enough. Sorry. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I was going to ask you was about, you know, when you switch off the lights and about to go to sleep, what's the one thing that you worry about when you switch off the lights and about to go to sleep? You're not supposed to worry about anything when you switch off the lights. So I keep my light <laughs> on until I'm done with anything that I think I'm taking uh, to my sleep with me. And I think that should work with everyone. I mean, I think I've been, in spite of all the struggles and all the failures, I've been blessed that whatever I have chosen to do has been great fun, uh, has been, you know, has been something I would want to do for a long period of time. Of course, there'll be bad days and good days, and you may be going back with sometimes you can you can stay awake with competitive pressure. You can stay awake by just looking at the other guy and saying, How did they do it? And I haven't. You can you can stay awake with so many things but outside of just problems. Most of them are emotional things in your mind. Um, then I think you need to deserve to keep the lights on <laughs> until you <laughs> till you actually figure it out, I guess. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, Winnie, I don't know if you want to come in. Yeah, I think we need to end. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. But I'll let Vinny take over. Thank you. Sudhir. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie, for your insights into, you know, what it will take to be future ready. Um, in terms of what the next 20 years for the social sector looks like, I think uh, pioneering efforts like CSR definitely deserve praise since an average of nearly, I think, 15,000 crore per year 
is being deployed by companies to support NGOs. Also, uh, SEBI's powerful move to launch a social stock exchange could be another game changer, which will definitely open up several avenues for NGOs to raise capital. But many in the sector are still worried that, you know, a lot more needs to be done to boost the sector. Uh, now, Ronnie, you've committed capital, talent, and time to address multiple social issues via the Swades uh, Foundation. And we sincerely thank you for that. In fact, Swades Foundation is also listed on the Help Your NGO portal. And I think it's essential that we all do our bit and, you know, be the change that we actually wish to see. So with this, Ronnie, may I request you to unveil the Hingo band? Yeah, with pleasure. And while I'm doing that, I also want to thank Ajit because he's been very supportive of my daughter's NGO, which is quite different from my NGO. So again, it's not like it passed on from generation and she started saying Swadesh is also mine. She started her own lighthouse project. Uh, so, well, here's the here's the one. And I think this is this is the band. So I hereby inaugurated. And um, Ajit's already worn it. So Booz already yeah. worn mine. <laughs> and um, okay. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, thank all you. those attending this webinar may be aware that for over 20 years, Help Your NGO has been working to increase transparency in the social sector and offer easy solutions to donors to support NGOs. We are proud to present to you our latest initiative to encourage individuals to um, you know, support NGOs working towards the UN SDGs, which is this Hingo Band. Let me just quickly share my screen. Now to support this effort, all you have to do is head over to the link shared in the chat box and purchase the Hingo Band, which will be packaged in a multi-purpose khadi pouch for just 200 rupees. Proceeds from the sale of the bands will be donated to charities vetted by our research team and not only will you receive 50% tax deduction, but also program reports for complete transparency so that you can review how your donations are being utilized by the supported NGOs. Today, we are also launching our Did You Hingo social media challenge. And we urge you all to participate by following these three easy steps. Click a photo of you wearing the Hingo band, post it on social media with, uh, with the hashtag Did You Hingo and tag three friends in fact, three or more friends to take on the challenge. And it's as simple as that. For us to be future ready, we believe that we need to hingo. So the question is, did you hingo today? Because I did. Uh, with this, we conclude the first session. Thank you once again, Ronnie, for sparing the time to speak with us and unveiling the hingo band. Thank you, Ajit, for moderating the session and Subhu for the Q&A round. Thank you to all the attendees for signing up and attending this session. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.